Hello maths fans, Dr Tom Crawford here at the University of Oxford and today I'm taking an A-level physics exam. Of course I am a mathematician, which is why I have enlisted the help here of Lewis who runs the YouTube channel Physics Online. He's, he's wearing the merch, this is very nice merch. Um, and yeah. Lewis, you challenged me to yeah, do this, didn't th you? That's right, so this is uh, an A-level physics paper, uh, normally sat by students who are maybe 18 years old in the UK. Yep. And, and I thought that, you like maths? Well, why don't we do a bit of physics, which is mainly maths as well. Um, did you do A-level physics yourself? I did not do A-level okay. <laughs> physics, so I, um, I agree with you though. I think, hopefully, there is enough of an overlap. And, and I think you yeah. said, I don't know, we'll see if this is true, but Lewis has claimed that he has picked slightly more mathematical questions. Yeah, that's that right. Okay. So I thought rather than doing the whole paper, I thought maybe we could just pick a few questions which are kind of fairly mathematical, you know, the yep. numerical answers. There's not too much underlying understanding of the actual physics. So no like big six marker wordy questions. So I thought, <laughs> let's see how you get on. And uh, yeah. And if, and if there is physics that I don't know, which there will be, I am going to use this resource that I have yeah, available yeah. to me. Yeah, I, I will help. Um, so, do you want to get started? Yeah, no, let's do it, let's do it. Yeah, so, so the first question, um, so this one here is about a car being dragged up a hill by a lorry, so it's like a real world scenario. Yep. Um, the question you can just see to the side, but the first part is about drawing a free body diagram. So... I'll that... be honest, I have no idea what free body diagram means, but I think I think I know by looking at the the picture. Yeah. So I, I will maybe I'll start by doing what I think yeah, yeah, it's go, asking me to go do. And, start and, and you will... can tell me if it is or isn't every yeah. time. Because <laughs> so what it's showing there to me is it's kind of taking a simplification of, of the image, right? We don't really care about the fact that it's a car or a truck. Mm -hmm. We're sort of modeling them as a point mass um, in in a way, at least for the diagram. So that's like the thing. We've got the 10 degree angle. Um, which is obviously going to be helpful for equating forces um, in certain directions. It's given me a normal contact force to the surface, so let's call that N. And then I'm going to guess there's going to be gravity, which is going to act vertically down. Would Again, would be my guess here that there's going to be an mg yep. gravity acting down, of course, vertical. Um, and then the truck is pulling it. The mass of the car is 1100, so maybe maybe I do know that. Maybe I'll just write that. So that's telling me 1100 kg. 10 degrees I've got. Car travels. I don't think I need the vertical distance yet. Not at all, no. Um, is, is the idea here... Oh, the truck is pulling the car at a constant speed. So am I... I'm guessing this... Is there supposed to therefore be an additional one here that's, that's like... Right. Yeah, so okay. there's, um, yeah, so this is the, so the friction is going against, and there's a force there, which is like, does it have a name? Would I just call it like towing or? Yeah, I mean, like, probably I'd say because we've got like a tow bar, there's going to be a tension inside it. So I'd say tension would be tension. a good one. Oh, um, right. yep. Yeah, and, and I suppose as well, the force down, I'd call it weight. So you talked about gravity acting downwards. Oh, okay. But, but the name of the force that this gravitational force provides on this is, is the is weight, weight of that object. So I agree, the mass times the gravity, right? That but yeah, yeah, but um, okay. looking at that, that's pretty much spot on, really. And, okay, good. <laughs> and, and the free body diagram is just to try and make real life as simple as possible. Yeah. So we ignore the fact it's a car, we've got, like you said, a point mass, and we just yep. want to think, okay, what are the forces acting on it? And that then helps us with subsequent questions, because we're trying to take, you know, real life gets complicated, um, mm -hmm. and we just want to make it as simple as possible. Yeah. And uh, yeah. That's not a bad start, actually. Yes. Awesome. So full marks, yeah, <laughs> yeah, two out of two for that. Okay, right, right. where are we going? So I feel like next... it's going to get harder. Well, you know, that's like the kind of, that's the warm, warming up yeah, one, yeah, isn't yeah. it? So um, the next one is a show question, and this is about the compo component of the weight acting down the slope. And we've got a number that we want to see. It's about 1,900 newtons. Okay, so I'm thinking this is then the component of weight acting down the slope. So that means if I were to draw it, let's do this in a different color. Yeah. So if I were to draw in like this and then form a right angle there, I think it wants me to do that bit. That's it, yeah, that's all it is. Okay, perfect. That was what I thought, so. And I think in the question as well, you've got the angle that the slope makes with the ground. Yeah, yeah, so we've got the 10 degrees oh, yeah, there. Of course, yeah, yeah. 
So then, um, does that necessarily mean that that one is 10 degrees? I think it, wait, does it? Let's not be silly about this. I think that is 10 degrees then, isn't it? Yes. Is that, I yeah. think that is 10 degrees as well. So if I know the weight, so I know the hypotenuse is 1100. Yeah. Um, so I'm gonna just draw the triangle down here just to be very clear as to what I'm doing. Uh, for myself, I have the right angle. I've got, I want this one, so let's call this X, the unknown that I want. I know this is 1100 and I know this one is 10 degrees. So I should be able to use trigonometry. That's right, yeah, yeah, so get a soccer term. Uh, get a, see, I would use, my mum told me this. Right. Silly old Harry caught a herring trawling over America. Oh, I thought silly old Harry couldn't afford his tarred old alligator. <laughs> <laughs> like, okay, so I've been saying it wrong, but yeah. Well, I mean, yeah. I'll, but if it's silly. It's all about silly Harry, yeah. isn't it? And if you can, if you can remember that, then it's Soccer just... toe is also quite yeah, good, Yeah, yeah, soccer toe is Soccer toe is very catchy. Um, okay, so I know the hypotenuse and I know the opposite. So I'm using sine. So sine of 10 degrees is equal to uh, the opposite x divided by 1100. So I think x is... Ooh, wait. Now you do get a calculator in a physics exam, so you don't have to do anything. But is this going to work? Memory. It should do. Sine of 10 degrees, am I definitely doing... Is that right? That's what I'm unsure about now. Because I've definitely got the opposite. Maybe it's not 10 degrees. No, it has to be 10 degrees. I want to say it's 10 degrees. Hmm. The component of the weight of the car acting down the slope is about 1900. Yeah, because I'm just yep. thinking, because this will be 1100 oh. times sine of 10, but that's going to be tiny. But sine of 10 you've degrees. looked at the mass there, not the weight. So I'm supposed to multiply the 1100 by 9.8. Yeah. Do we use 9.8? Okay, so <laughs> 9.8 is good. Um, 9.81? Yeah, 9.81 tends to be the accepted value. Okay. Um, right, so, so yeah. that's what I was doing wrong. So I've used the mass, right? I've literally written 1100 and forgot yeah. to multiply by that. Okay. So it's 1100, let's write G, and then it's correct. That sense, yeah. And then that's G, and then that's times G. So I don't have a calculator. As anyone who's seen me do an exam video before, they will know <laughs> I do not, I, I just refuse to use calculators because I'm an idiot. I can um, see mine in the distance just out of shot. So I'm, <laughs> the temptation to go and get it is, is, is strong. So. Okay, so sine of 10 degrees is quite small. I mean, I, I believe that will probably be right. Yeah, that would be right, yeah. Okay, and, <laughs> and I think, when you get these questions which say show that or show me, often the number you get is going to be similar to this. And then you but can say, well, that's approximately equal to, say, 1900 newtons. Yeah, and, yep, yep, yep. But there's a reason they do that. Because some people might come into this exam, they may be unsure about what the free body diagram means, they maybe mess up their maths potentially. But that number could be used in a subsequent part of the calculation. So it's like, yep. even if you can't get those first few marks, it doesn't stop you with the rest of the question. Agreed. Good exam. Good exam tips. Cool. Yeah. No, I agree. Do we want to calculate it for the rest of this, or are we? Gonna... Am I going to need? I mean, at this point, I'm just going to keep going. You know, I'm just... okay. Well, let's, let's just see. keep going. Personally, I, do, I rely on the calculator. You know, put the numbers <laughs> in. Um, you know, I can't. Yeah, I, I can't do that one in my head. Obviously. Yeah. Okay. Not a side of ten degrees. Is... Right. Okay. So now we've got a question about the total frictional force acting on the car, uh, which is given to us as three hundred. Three hundred. So that's three hundred that way. Yeah, and labeling the diagram is like really important. You know, if you've got numbers. Put them on a diagram, it kind of builds that picture, doesn't it? Builds the story. I think I actually know what the answer is. Sorry, I just got okay, excited. Right. I know what the answer is going to be, I think. Um, calculate the force provided by the tow bar on the car. So you've got 300 from friction. We've yeah. just worked out the weight component is 1900. Yeah. So therefore, the total going down the slope. So I should write this. Total down slope. The total force is the 300 from the friction yeah. plus the 1900 for the weight component. And I don't believe there's anything else because the reaction force and the other component of weight are perpendicular, so they don't affect it. Exactly. So that's going to be 2,200 newtons. And then I am, it's, it did say constant speed, right? Yeah, so the car's going to constant, constant speed. speed. So therefore, there's no acceleration. So therefore, the total force has to be zero. Yeah. So the force is 2,200. And that's right. So something in equilibrium can Sorry, be moving. Sorry, I'm just celebrating. Yeah, 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 I'm, like, yeah, I'm doing right. physics questions. <laughs> yeah, but it's like, it's an equilibrium. And people think if it's an equilibrium, you know, balanced forces, something's going to be stationary. Well, that can be true. But in this case, it's, we've got yeah, something moving, constant. but it's just going at that constant speed. So yeah, that's brilliant. Awesome. Right. So now we're going to look at the work done oh, by the force provided by the tow bar 
as a car travels from A to B. Now, this so, sounds like physics. <laughs> it is, done. but it's, um, yeah, so, so work done. I mean, that's just another word for the energy kind of transferred, you know. So Work is force times distance. Is that, am I remembering that correct? Yeah, that's right, yeah. Okay, okay, maybe I can squeeze this at the top. So I, I think, if I'm remembering correctly, that if the work is equal to the force times the distance, then I know the force. I want, so that's 2200, yep. and then I need to know the distance. Now, I don't know the distance, but I do know that it's going from the bottom. Yeah, from the, no, we're we going all the way from the bottom. Yeah, from A to B. Yes, and we're, oh, it's, it's being, it's going up a total of 120. That's right, yeah. Okay, so can I use that? Yes, so I need another triangle to work out, because I need the actual distance traveled, which is obviously the hypotenuse length. That's right, yeah. yeah. Right, good. I'm enjoying this in case any of you can't tell. <laughs> this is fun. <laughs> this is fun. Because uh, it feels like it feels like it's things I know, but like thought about in a very different way to how a mathematician might. I don't yeah. Know. Okay, so it's 10 degrees. We know the height is 120. So therefore, I want to know the unknown hypotenuse. So it's sine again. So I can say that sine of 10 degrees is equal to the opposite 120 divided by h. So h is 120 divided by sine of 10. So therefore, the work done is going to be 2200 multiplied by h. Yes. Which is? Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's where I would use my calculator that I don't have. Yeah. Um, so I'm just going to say W for work is, again, let's pretend I had a calculator, 2200 times 120 yep. divided by sine of 10. And that's going to be quite a big number because sine of 10 is quite close to zero. It is. And, but you'd expect that because, you know, if you think yeah. about the real world scenario, you've got a, a lorry pulling a car up a hill, which goes up 120 meters, which is what, 400 feet? That's actually a lot. Something yeah. like that. So, yeah, 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 yeah. so you're going to have big numbers. And I think yep. this is why sometimes in, in physics, especially, you have to think, not only does the answer kind of look right, but does it actually make real world yep. sense? You know, if you've yes. got four joules and it's gone such a big height. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I mention this to my students all the time in the applied maths courses. Okay. Right? When I'm like, you know, my research is fluids and I really like the idea that when I get an answer, I'm like, but does this actually make sense? Can I, th I can think of, you know, the ocean. Does, does my answer feel yeah. like that would happen in the ocean? Yeah. Cool. Um, so we've, we've got most of it done and now on to part E. So here we go. This is where, this is where the physics kicks in. Um, actually, a bit of engineering as well. So I, I didn't actually do a physics degree. I did engineering at university. And this is like the kind of bread and butter. So, so this question... I'm not going to know this one, am I? Well, <laughs> the no. way you're setting this up is basically like, don't worry, Tom, this is, this is, this is not for math. No, but it, this is for me. This is like the best question on the paper. You know, it's like okay. kind of my thing. So we've got a steel tow bar and it gives the dimensions as a length of half a metre. We've got the diameter. I'm going to draw this. Is... Uh, the diameter is about 1.2 times 10 to the minus 2 metres. Okay, so I know that D is 1.2 times 10 to the minus 2 metres short, and then I know the length is 0 0.5 metres. Yeah, so this is a piece of steel, um, yep. and it's given the young modulus as 2.0 times 10 to the 11 pascals. I've heard of the young modulus, but yep. I couldn't tell you a formula. You know, the formula it's going to go into, I think I might have to use my first cheat sheet of having you with me. That's fine, yeah. So um, we've got the dimensions of a, a real object and we've got a material property. So this is, mm -hmm. you know, it doesn't matter how big the piece of steel is, this particular kind of steel has this property. And it's to do with yep. the way that if you apply a force to this, how that material deforms. Yep. And it tends to be that materials which are tougher tend to have a higher Young modulus. Yep. Now, what you also get in the exam would be a data sheet that has formulas that you could kind of pick on. And I suppose if you're an A-level student, you probably should know this off, off okay. by heart. So um, there's a few I want to give to you. So the first one is that the Young modulus is equal to stress divided by strain. Okay. Stress divided by strain. Yeah. And the, the next two things are that the stress is equal to the force divided by area. Yeah, I did know that one actually. Yeah, stress is force over area. Yeah, and that. strain is to do with the deformation of something, and it's equal to the extension divided by the original length. Extension over original length. Okay. And so 
so the, first of all, the stress is kind of like, um, it's like the kind of internal pressure. You know, we, we measure yep. pressure by force over yeah, area. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so stress is given in pascals, the, the unit that we measure pressure in. Yep. Um, so if you know the force in newtons and you know the area that that's acting on, we can work out the internal stress of that object. Yep. The strain is how much something deforms compared to how, how long it was originally. Yep. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. that's a dimensionless kind of number. Yes. And if you divide this by that, uh, we have the young modulus. And if we were to yeah. plot a graph this, we'd have this kind of line, nice kind of linear region at the beginning. Um, and so with that information, looking at the question, what, what do you know? So oh, because it's asking me to calculate the extension. Yeah. yeah. Then I can do this. Okay, I can do that. Cool. Yep. No, I'm happy. Now I'm happy. This is now just maths and algebra. Okay. But I now feel like I understand Jung's modulus, so thank you. A little bit more. A little <laughs> bit more. Yeah, 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 definitely. Right. So what do I know? I know the force, because we worked that out earlier. That's right. Yep. Right. We had the, the way, we had the frictional one plus the weight one. So I think the force is 2200 in total. That's right. Yep. Because that was, yeah, I decided that was the tension. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's going to be in the tow bar. Um, and then the area it's acting on. Oh. Now, okay, is so this going to be the cross section or is it going to be the surface area? So it's going to be the cross sectional area. The cross sectional area, okay, okay. And Which if, if I was to ask you what's yeah. the area of a circle, you'd be saying pi r squared. But this is now like kind of physics. Um, and in reality, if, if you had a piece of steel and you wanted to measure the diameter, you, you wouldn't be able to actually measure the radius directly. You tend to measure yep. the diameter you know, from one side to the other. And in the question, they've given you the diameter. And probably one of my, so. one of my favorite equations, it's like so simple, but rather than saying pi r squared, I'll be saying pi d squared over four. So if I've got pi d squared on the bottom and four on the top. All right. Yeah, no, I'll do it. I'll, I'll do it the physics way. I mean, you can also <laughs> say pi r squared. You just take no, 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 I'm, I'm good, two, I'm good but... with this. So, OK, so I know everything there. Yeah. Uh, again, I'm not going to put this into a calculator because apparently I've decided I'm doing the whole exam without a calculator. <laughs> we'll see how we go with the next question. Yeah. yeah. Um, times d squared. So that's just going to be 1.2 times 10 to the minus 2. And that whole thing is squared. So that is my formula for the stress. That's, that's going to give me a number. Yeah. So that would give you the number for the stress. Yeah. Cool. And then the strain. Um, so the extension is unknown, so let's call it x. The original length is 0 0.5. So now I can put both of them into the Young's modulus. So I can say that 2.0 times 10 to the 11. I'm really enjoying the accompanying organ music we've got. I think you could probably all hear this. I didn't Someone's... want to mention it, no. I didn't want to say, yeah. Um... <laughs> Someone's practicing the organ below <laughs> us in the, in the college chapel. Um, it's nice. It, it feels relaxing as I'm doing you know, this. This is, this is an amazing place. I, I must yeah. say, Oxford University, or the University of Oxford, as I probably should say. Um, yeah, like where we are at the moment, it's, it's just just amazing. Like, I, yeah, I, like I, I can't here. complain either. It's pretty cool. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, two point zero times ten to the eleven is equal to the stress over the strain. I've got this formula for the stress, so I'll put it all in. Divided by pi times one point two times ten to the minus two squared. And then I now need to divide by the strain, so let's multiply by the inverse, so times 0.5 divided by x. So now I have an equation where I know everything, yep. and I would put it all into my calculator, and I can get x. That's right. And if you had a calculator, what you'd find <laughs> is that the extension is actually a really, really small number. I was expecting it to be just from my intuition of a tow bar and it being steel. I'm like, it's, it's hardly going to extend at exactly. all. Exactly. Right? If you had a, a steel yep. tow bar, and it extended by half a meter every time you pulled something that just yeah. wouldn't work, would it? Yeah. Yep. And I think I guess the clue is here. We if we take kind of the x up to the other side, that's huge. And, we've, by and that. we're dividing by a really big number. Yeah. We tend to find that the young modulus is you know like you know two hundred gigapascals or something like that. It, you know these are really big numbers. Yeah. And that's why things like metal only have small extensions. And in probably everyday life, you wouldn't even notice it. No. 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 Yeah. No. I. I mean. Yeah. I, I would expect the answer to be very small. Yeah, definitely, because you've got a 10 to the minus 4, you're dividing by a 10 to the 11. So you're going to get, like, 10 to the minus 7. Yeah, it's going to be tiny. It's gonna exactly. Be tiny. Yeah, yeah. Right, so that's, um, that's, the, first, that's the first question done. a physics question. <laughs> um, right, do you want some more? Yes, I'm enjoying this. Okay, I'm enjoying this. Let's do it. If you're feeling inspired to try some physics questions for yourself, then head over to the worksheet I've put together in Maple Learn, featuring three questions from the same A-level exam paper I'm struggling through with Lewis. 
The first question looks at the kinetic energy of an oscillating system and asks you to identify which graph is correct. MapleLearn will very helpfully show you a plot of the energy of an oscillator which should help in identifying the correct answer. Question 2 is another from the multiple choice section of the exam, but this time you're asked to work out the distance travelled by each of the objects. Once again, the plots generated by MapleLearn will likely be very helpful for your calculations. Finally, we come to a question about a rotating disk, which asks you to calculate the value of a constant using some experimental data. To access the worksheet, just click the link in the video description, and if you would like to sign up for Premium to access all of the features MapleLearn has to offer, be sure to use the discount code in the box below. Now, let's see what else Lewis has in store for me. Right, so we've done very mechanics-y question that felt to me, right? Yeah, like, yeah, it was, like yeah. force diagrams, balancing forces, learn some physics. Now I know what the Young's modulus is. <laughs> it is. I need to remember now, stress divided by strain. That's it, yeah. Okay, um, so where are we going next? Right, again, I thought I'd, I think this might be similar to what a lot of students do when they do A-level maths. Mm -hmm. um, I know when I've often taught this, the students are like, oh, we've done this before. And they're often taught this by their maths teacher and then they yeah. get taught it again by their physics teacher, which means that actually students are quite good at this. So. Uh, do they not, I mean, I guess we'll see, but do they not do it in a different way they, they might you know, do. like the, yeah. the math students answer the question in a different way to how the physics students might. And could that not potentially cause confusion? I, I don't know. I, I think potentially it can. Um, yeah. I would say, though, that probably 99% of A-level physics students tend to choose maths as well. And also, if you're wanting to maybe take it further, say you, know, say you do like it and you want to go and study physics or engineering at university, then maths is really important. It is absolutely essential. And you heard it here, kids. <laughs> yeah, and, and I, you know, I, I really liked A-level maths when I did it a yeah, long time yeah, ago. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, so this All one right. here, this is uh, like um, a projectile motion kind of question. So we've got a projectile, in this case an arrow. It's being fired up into the air and it's traveling towards the target. I'll start drawing as you are explaining the question for us. So we've got an arrow. Um, initially fired at 11 degrees above the horizontal. All right, so we've got an arrow, it's gonna do, whoop, I know what it's gonna do, so I'm gonna draw it. that. Yep. Uh, and it's coming out at an angle of 11 degrees there. And at 68 meters per second. And at, um, let's just write it as V. Yeah. 68 uh, meters per second, yep. Um, and it's gonna go 90 meters towards the target, or the target is 90 meters, meters away. away. Yep. And the target's at the same height as it's launched from. Yep. Gotcha. So that's again quite important. Um, so I know that to the target is 90 meters. Yeah, and actually the yep. question here, it kind of, it duplicates the information. So it's already labeled on the diagram and it's yep. stated underneath. But it's this bit at the bottom, which is like the, the thing you think, oh, thankfully they've done that. Air resistance has negligible effect on the motion of the arrow. So Classic physics question. Yeah, so uh, <laughs> we're just going to ignore what happens in real life. Yes. This is an ideal problem. Love it. Projectile um, motion, no air resistance. Yeah. Um, okay, so the first one, actually Ooh. it doesn't go straight into the math. So it doesn't. This is about describing how the kinetic energy of the arrow changes during its journey from when it's fired until it reaches its maximum height. Okay. So it has an initial um, has an initial maximum, I think. Yeah. I think there's initial initially maximum ke uh, because it's as soon as it leaves, it's sort of fired at the speed. So we know what that is. Even that's going to be half mv squared, right? Where I've got yeah. v. And so we know that it's got this maximum, and then as soon as it starts to travel. Gravity is pulling it down, so there's a component of that that's going to be going against the motion. So it's going to be slowing it down consistently. Yes. Um, how does it change from when it is fired? Okay, so initially maximum, it's then going to decrease, and then I just need to think about what's going to happen at the maximum. So it's maximum, it's decreasing, and then the maximum height. Oh. Oh, I don't think it's going to reach zero. It's going to reach a minimum, possibly. Yes, it is, and I think that's the key to it. It's going to reach a minimum kinetic energy at the top, isn't it? Because yeah. then it's going to start to speed up under gravity, that's potentially. Right. Yeah, yeah. So I don't, 
Maybe, do I know that it's definitely at its maximum? Maybe I don't, maybe I should change that. I'm less confident because as it, if it was falling a very long distance, I feel like it could continue to accelerate through gravity and potentially be go faster. Potentially, but I guess the question says, but only for that first from its dip. first part of that journey. So yeah. from when it's launched until it gets to its highest point, which is the only bit we're really considering at this time, yeah. that's the only bit that we need to really think about. Gotcha. So just to be safe, yeah. I am going to say that it initially has, um, has I guess, half M times 68 squared okay. <laughs> kinetic energy. <laughs> I'm going to say initially we have like a value. Yeah. It's then definitely going to decrease continuously from that sort mm -hmm. of starting value. Yeah. It's going to come down. And then at the maximum point, it will reach its minimum. So it reaches Ke will reach uh, minimum at maximum height. Yeah, and I think you've got it there. I mean, you didn't need to even put the equation in to kind of do the kind of calculation. Um, and yeah, it's decreasing to a minimum. It's still moving at the highest yes. point. So it still has some horizontal components exactly. of velocity. And I suppose we can also think about that initially it was stored in the kinetic store of the arrow. And as it went higher and higher, some of that energy was transferred yep. to the gravitational potential store. Yes. Um, but it does, it's not zero. It's only, and I wouldn't want to do this in real life, is if you're to fire an arrow straight up, it's only if it went straight up into the air and it then stopped it and went zero? straight back down. That's the only yeah. time it would be zero. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, so I think uh, two, two good marks there, well earned. All right. Right. Next. Now, the next one <laughs> is where we get into the calculations. So uh, we want to show that the time taken for the arrow to reach its maximum height is about 1.3 seconds. Okay. So the time to reach maximum. So <laughs> I know how I would do this. I feel like this isn't how you're meant to do it, especially because this is two marks. I would be very tempted to basically go Newton's second law. Okay. And be like, F equals MA, where the force I have is gravity. There's no other air resistance. I have an initial velocity. Um, so I basically want to, would it be as simple as that? Would I just say minus MG is my force is equal to M times, oh, I'd have to be careful about the Y component and the X component. Uh, okay, no, no, maybe I could do this. Maybe this can work. All right, I am gonna. I'm, I'm probably going down a dead end. I, I think gonna, I'm I can gonna see... attempt to go my own way. Okay, dead well, end. let's see how you get on. Yeah, I know this isn't this isn't how you're meant to do it as a physics. Student, I, I think, <laughs> I think ultimately, in anything like this, there's loads of ways to get to the correct answer. And maybe mm -hmm. going back to first principles, it shouldn't be incorrect, but there might be a quicker, simpler way to do it. Okay, so there has to be. So I know that the, the y component of the force is minus mg. It's acting down in the y direction. Yep. Now, but then there is an initial velocity. So there is, do I therefore need to include that in the force? Probably. OK, so I, I don't actually care about the y one, do I? Or do I? I care about the. I care about when the the maximum height is going to be when the change in y is zero. So I do care about the y force. Okay. But does that force change throughout its journey? Once it's launched. Yeah. Does gravity ever stop? No, no, no. Gravity is definitely there. Yeah. And doesn't change. But it's the. But I, I'm just thinking whether or not. Mm. So I want to say something like gravity as my force is equal to mass times the acceleration in the y direction, which is going to be y double dot. So that's my y position, two derivatives with respect to time. OK. So I think that is true. Now, I don't know whether or not, I can't remember <laughs> whether or not <laughs> the initial velocity, because there's definitely a y component of the velocity, yes. which I can use trigonometry for. Yep. And I'm unsure whether that comes into the force or whether that comes into when I integrate and then use that as an initial condition. 
as to what the velocity needs to be at t equals zero. Okay. That's what I'm unsure about right now. I yeah. feel like I want to include... I feel like I want to include that. I'm going to... I think I want to include the initial velocity. So... I know, I'm aware I'm just going to be rederiving some equations. That's <laughs> I could fine. have just quoted. That's fine. Yeah. So I think I have an 11 degree thing. I know that the diagonal is 68. So the y component here, um, I don't know, let's call it, um, it's the opposite one, isn't it? So let's call it O. So again, it's sine. So I know that sine of 11 degrees is O over 68. So I know that my initial y velocity is 68 times sine of 11. Yeah, that's so I correct. think that's yep. also going to be in that equation. So I think what I've got, I'm going to write this on the next page, 68 sine 11. So I think I've got 68 times sine of 11 degrees minus mg is equal to my double dot. I think. Could be wrong, but I'm going to go with it for a moment and see if I get a sensible answer. Because now I integrate once with respect to time. So I'm going to get 68 sine 11 degrees um, minus mg, and that's going to give me a t uh, plus a c equals m times y dot. Now, what do I know about the initial velocity? I know that y dot at t equals naught. Oh, this is where it comes in. It's not at that start bit. <laughs> okay, I get it now. I figured out. Okay. Sorry, I can tell you're just dying to be like, what are no, you doing, I, Tom? But I would say that, that shouldn't be, be there. I was going to say that because yeah, no, you were no, then I've mixing up a force. Now. You know, mg is a force, but you're mixing velocity, up with a velocity yeah, of yeah, meters per second. Sense. Yeah, yeah. I, I just couldn't remember. Yeah, I okay. knew it comes in. Now it comes in because it's c. Because when I integrate, at yeah. t equals naught, I lose that. But I know what this has to be. So I know that y dot at t equals naught has to be exactly 68 sine of 11. So therefore, C is equal to M times 68 sine of 11. That is C. So I know now that M y dot equals minus M G T plus M. I can cancel the M finally. Sine of 11 degrees. Right, so I'm going to get rid of all the M's. All those M's. Don't care about any of them. So I've got that the velocity... Laughing at myself, how it okay. does this. Velocity is minus gt plus the initial bit. So I know, let's call that uh, v of y, which is 68 sine of 11. I know that. Okay. This is one of the equations I could have quoted, isn't it? Um, <laughs> so. I know yeah. I'm going to integrate again. Okay, I, I, I'm going to integrate again and get minus g t squared over 2 plus the initial velocity times t plus another constant d. Um, and now what do I know? I know that the initial height at t equals naught, y is zero, so d is zero. So I think the equation I have for the height, I don't know if this is going to help me answer the question, but I've do got an what? equation I, I, for the height. Do you know, I'm amazed that you have got to the right position. <laughs> you can slightly different notation uh, that could have just been done in one step. Um, I, I should say as well, actually, I think on the front of this exam paper, they do give a list of equations that can be used. Which is going to basically be this equation, isn't it? Yeah. This is one of the Suvat ones, isn't it? The famous... It is, yeah. So what we have, I guess, we, we don't always call it Y. We might call it S, maybe the displacement. Okay, yep. Uh, I was we, just thinking X and Y, sort of. Yeah, of course. My, yeah, that no, was I, just, to me, as a mathematician, I was like, Y is going to be my vertical height, X is going to be my horizontal. Yeah. So we've got an S there. We've got the acceleration term, which is G. Yep. Uh, you've got VG, which is the initial velocity U. VY, I think. Was it VY? It, sorry, yes. yeah. Um, so initial got, vertical velocity. Yeah, so you've got like a U, a T, an A, and an S. So that's one of the CVAT equations, yeah. I don't know if this is helpful for the question. So the time derivative okay. is maximum height. So what do I know is happening at the maximum height? I know that the change in Y is the Y velocity zero. Yes. Mm -hmm. So I know that y dot has to be zero at the yeah. maximum height. Absolutely. So what? Oh, yeah. So yeah, yeah, good. So y dot, yeah, I think I have got it because I've got it there, haven't I? Yeah. This one. So from star, I've got y dot equals naught at uh, max height because there's no change in the y direction. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's no vertical velocity. Yeah. So therefore, um, that happens when 
g times t equals the initial velocity, which is 68 sine of 11 degrees. So the answer is t is 68 sine of 11 divided by g. Is the time. I, I, I don't know. I don't, what, what, num <laughs> what number is that? OK, actually, that the question about says right. about 1.3 seconds. OK, sine of 11 is like quite small. 68 yeah. is, is 68. <laughs> yeah. And g is like 9. I would buy that. This is saying the top is a little bit. So sine of 11 is like, I don't know, like 0.2 or something. So like 0.2 of that would be like 12-ish over 9-ish. I but, think that's about 1.2. Do you know what? I think, I think you got it. Yeah. You got the right answer. Yeah. So really with this one. Um, <laughs> with the most ridiculous method. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. Well, do you know, it's, it's the right answer. So that's important. I would say there's probably a more efficient way to get two marks. It's normally in an yeah. exam, you know, you normally get maybe a mark a minute. Okay, um, <laughs> well, that so, took yeah. me like 10, yeah. Okay, but... What are these equations then? I'm intrigued now, you, the SUVAT equations, what are the ones that in general a physics student would know to use in this situation? So, uh, so the SUVAT equations, um, these are just ones to do with the equations of motion. Yeah. Uh, we don't need to know about the mass, because nope. I think we found then that the mass kind of cancelled. Mm -hmm. uh, so we've got S, which is displacement. Yeah. So that's just our vector quantity for, for distance, really. Yeah. Uh, U is the initial velocity. Yeah. V is the final velocity. Yeah. A is the acceleration and T is the time. And these are vectors. Uh, is time a vector? Like no, not that board. one. Yeah. Right. But yeah, a, so, the so, other yeah. ones they will exactly, be. Exactly, right. they're vectors. Yeah, yeah. So they can be positive yeah. or negative. Yeah. And when you've got projectile motion like this, we've got both, we can kind of think about the horizontal component of yep. maybe yeah, velocity, yeah, yeah. which doesn't change. Yep. But it's only really the vertical component that's changing over time. Yep. And what I, my approach for something like this is I would write down SUVAT just vertically down the page, and then I'd go through the question trying to identify what's being given to me. So if you were to maybe just write SUVAT down vertically, I, I guess you've already done it. Yes. And then From the question, we know that the maximum height is a, sorry, um, we want to find the time. Now to go to its yep. maximum height. We don't know that one. Yeah, we don't know how high it goes. Acceleration is gravity. Yeah, so that's 9.81. And if, yeah, let's say upwards is positive. So yeah. minus 9.81. We know that its initial velocity upwards is 68 sine 11. Yeah, 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 yeah. So in component form, that would be uh, 68 sine of 11 yeah. in the j direction, which would be the y. And there's going to be a, what's it going to be in the case in the other one? Oh, we don't need, need to know this. that yet. We don't even need to know that. We're All just, right. Yeah, because for however long it's going upwards, it's going to be <laughs> yeah, the same yeah, time yeah, as yeah, going yeah. horizontally. Yeah. And actually, sometimes what I do is I just put an arrow maybe Coastal, pointing yeah. upwards to show that I'm just considering yeah. uh, C mm -hmm. that in the vertical direction. So we've got uh, A is minus 9.81. Yep. But the final velocity, when it gets to the highest point, in it, it's going to be zero. It's zero. So I know that one. And so now we've got U, V, and A. We don't know t, but there's going to be a SUVAT equation which matches. Involves, okay. Yeah, and that's just v equals u plus at. Now, Amazing. if you're a student doing, who may be watching that's this, literally what I you'll be do, like, but... yeah, that, that, yeah, and that's, <laughs> and that's what you did exactly. Um, I derived SUVAT yeah, equation. But, yeah, 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 but yeah, you yeah. derived it. That, I think it shows that the, the mass is working, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, again, okay. all we had then was the initial value, which was 68 sine 11 minus yeah, yeah, yeah. 9.81 uh, times t would be equal to zero. So... You did exactly the same. Yeah, 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 yeah. So he has a zero, so it equals that one. Yeah. And then, Plus or you could rearrange to say. 9.81 times t, uh, minus 9.81 times t. Yeah, and then it gives you and the then, same answer that I got. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So we've done, the, done part B. <laughs> okay. Um, but the next one is kind of, kind, of, kind of similar. So this one says that the arrow, it actually misses the target. Okay. And we want to calculate the horizontal distance measured along the baseline by which the arrow misses the target. So now we want to know how far does it travel horizontally? Yeah, exactly. Okay, so I, I'm going to derive this again. Oh. <laughs> yeah, because I don't know okay. SUVAT, so... Um, okay, yeah, fair enough. Let me, let yeah, me think cool. about how I would derive it, and then maybe you can tell me what, this, what the SUVAT equation yeah, I should course, use yeah. would be. Yeah. Okay, so I'm thinking then the horizontal force is zero. Correct. Yep. There is no horizontal force. So, again, Newton's second law therefore tells me that mx double dot is zero. So I'm going to integrate and get m times x dot is constant, which is my initial velocity, mm -hmm. which is going to be, I knew I'd need this, so that's now going to be adjacent. So it's going to be 68 cos of 11. 
I think. Yep. Uh, let me just check. Caught a herring. So A is 68 cos of 11, yeah. Okay, so that's 68 cos of 11 degrees is mx dot. So then I would integrate again. Oh, no, wait, no, times m, which, of course, is going to cancel because x dot has to be that, yeah. So x dot is 68 cos of 11 degrees. So that's my initial x velocity. Mm -hmm. Well, that's my x velocity equation, which, as you've said, obviously doesn't change, but the position does because I integrate again and get 68 cos of 11 degrees times t uh, plus another constant. Initial horizontal displacement is going to be zero. Initially, yeah. Yep, so right. D is zero again. So I know, okay, so this isn't going to give me the answer I want, but I, because I need to know the time it takes to get there. But this is going to be the answer. I just now need to know what's like the time it's flying through the air. And I guess partly we did that last time. Because we worked out the time to reach its maximum height. But is it super symmetric? It should be, Ooh. yes. It should be. Yeah, 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 I'm tempted to say, so the time will be 2.6. That's it, yeah. Because it's symmetry. And you're yeah. allowed to invoke that? Well, the time it takes to go up is the same as the time it takes to come down. I mean, yeah. you, you could calculate it by using CVAT again. Yeah. Uh, but here, you know, we'd, okay. we'd have... Okay. Um, yeah, no, I, I, lo I love the symmetry arguments. We so. just kind of swap over the U and V terms, and you yeah. get exactly the same time. Okay, good. So it's just two times the peak. So we know that t is 2.6. So I think x is 68 cos of 11 times 2.6. Which again, we have no idea is correct or not because I don't have a calculator. But again, this is our kind of perfect physics world where we ignore, you know, what actually happens in real yes, life with, yes, you know, yes. wind. There's no and air things. resistance. Yeah. And it might be in reality, it might take less time to go up than it does to come back down. But we've got the distance then that it's traveled. But the that wasn't the question, was it? No, the question oh. says... Carry state the horizontal distance measured on the baseline which the arrow misses the target. So cos of 11 is very close to 1. Okay. So that's 60, approximately like 60-ish times 2.6. So that's going to be like 150 or something. So it's clearly more than the 90 of the target. So I need to say the answer to the question <laughs> is the answer I have. So it misses by this one minus 90. Yeah. So it misses by 68 cos of 11 degrees times 2.6. I really should just have a calculator. Minus 90. <laughs> yeah, no, good yeah. point. I, I thought I'd done it, but you're right. It says how much does it miss the target, so I have to subtract off the 90 to the target. Yeah, and that's the correct method, and I think it's about 74 metres, something like that. So, yeah, it yep. kind of completely right. flies well beyond it. Yep. Um, okay, so we've got, again, like another kind of SUVAT thing, but... For the, for the previous question, we were looking at the vertical component of velocity. Now we're just really considering that yep. horizontal component. Mm -hmm. Right, we then go into another question. We'll keep going, shall we? Yeah, yeah, so I'm now, enjoying this. So, again. yeah, so, so this is now um, a similar arrow, but it's fired horizontally into a target at close range okay. on wheels. You know, this <laughs> okay. is, a kind of, I guess, a made up scenario just for, for the example. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but the first one, it's just so, what do we mean by an inelastic collision? So elastic to me means that there is some give in the material. So as you hit okay. it with a force, it's going to like stretch or move, or there's going to be something. Yeah. So if it's inelastic, I think that means that all of the energy is just immediately absorbed and there's no like movement on the, the, the material itself. Like it doesn't rebound, it's not like rubber. There's no like yeah. ripples or vibrations as the thing hits. It just hits and... Again, I guess this is like kind of perfect physics world. And I guess we have two main categories of collisions. You've got elastic and inelastic. And if we think about an elastic collision, it's where maybe things come in and they bounce off each other. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yep, yep. And, you know, there's often examples of like, you know, snooker balls or billiard balls. Yes, that yes, yes. Absolutely. Have these perfectly yep. elastic things. And, and really, if we think about energy, in a perfectly elastic collision, no energy is lost. So maybe things mm -hmm. come in at, say, 10 meters per second. They all bounce off at 10 meters per second. And we don't lose any yep. uh, kinetic energy. In an inelastic collision, we still conserve the total energy because yep. energy can't be created or destroyed. Yep. We conserve momentum, as always, in yep. like lots of collisions. But we, but some of that kinetic energy has been transferred to another form. Maybe it's uh, sorry, another store. Maybe so. Maybe uh, as this collision has taken place, some of the kinetic energy is transferred to the thermal store and things heat yep. up. And often, when you have inelastic collisions, the things kind of stick together. 
Okay. And so in this case, rather than the arrow... It's coming in and then... So yeah. it's going to push the wheels back. It's going to be the next part of the question. It is, it? yeah, it is. <laughs> I know where this is going. Because you wouldn't want an arrow that hits the target and then bounces back at the same speed. Yeah. Um, just in the opposite direction. So yeah, in elastic collisions, it's where we don't have um, the kinetic energy uh, conserved. That's going to be transferred to another store. Perfect. That's all really it's asking. Target Which then, I guess, leads on to the next question. Oh, God. Target's around the wheels. The target's a much larger mass than the mass of the arrow. Okay, fine. Yeah. Using ideas of momentum, explain the velocity of the target immediately after the arrow sticks into the target. So you very helpfully told me that momentum was conserved. Yeah. So I have a feeling that's going to be helpful. So if I think about momentum's conserved, um, momentum is mass times velocity. Yes. I don't know if this is going to help, but I'm going to just think of it as mass times velocity. So I, I'm guessing the idea that they want me to think about because they've mentioned in the question, is the target has a really, really big mass. Yeah. So the arrow has a very, very small mass and therefore has a large velocity. Well, it has 68. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I know that it's, the momentum is conserved, so let's call it um, m in is equal to uh, 68 times uh, mass of arrow, which is small. Yeah. But then I'm going to assume that it's conserved, so the momentum out, which you know I mean after it's hit, is going to be whatever the velocity is. Um, so let's just call it velocity of the wheels times the mass of the target. So I think what it wants me to do is say the initial mass is really, really small. So the outgoing, okay, so this is, let me circle this. I think I'm arguing that this is very small for the arrow. Yeah. And then afterwards, this is now really big. But these two things need to be balanced. That's right. So this is kind of, that's like big, and this is big, so that's small. So basically this velocity has got to be very, very small. Exactly, yeah. Because so I'm just thinking like, this is, you know, 68 is pretty big, definitely compared to the mass of the arrow. Yeah. So you've got a big thing times a small thing. We're told that it's going to be conserved as it leaves. We're told the mass is the big thing now, so the velocity has to be the small thing. Exactly. Woo! Would that be all they'd want? Like, I, I think, yeah. Because like, there's I, no values, right? There's no, like... No, and I, I think, okay. actually, these questions are sometimes harder than the mathematical, you know, <laughs> yeah. calculation. It gave me the numbers. I'd be like, I know what I'm doing. Like, done. But, yeah, yeah, and, yeah, and I know that this is the thing where lots of people think, have I explained enough? Yeah. You know, have I yeah, yeah, thought yeah. about the underlying physics? And what we're looking at there is we have a closed system where momentum is conserved. Yep. The momentum before is equal to the momentum afterwards. Yep. But the mass afterwards is so much bigger that the velocity afterwards is going to be really small. Yes. And I think this is the kind of thing where sometimes uh, you might see a film where somebody's shot or something by a bullet and they go flying backwards. Yeah. But actually, the momentum of that small projectile, it might be traveling really quickly, but it's actually so small. quite, quite yeah. a small mass. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. you yeah. know, that kind of, you know, the, the movie action of people falling back to <laughs> the glass of the windows isn't always actually how it happens. Otherwise, any time somebody fired a rifle in, the, you know, and actually they caused the bullet to go forwards, that person would be flung backwards as yep. well. Yep, um, yep, yep, yep. And yeah, so I think you've got it there in terms of explaining that using ideas and momentum. Awesome. Right, so that's two big questions. Yes. We've had a go. I noticed that... Um, when you were sort of scrolling through the paper, there were some multiple choice questions. Yeah, multiple choice. They're not easy. This is the oh, thing okay. I, think, no, I mean, they are, I think that multiple choice questions have their own challenge because although that might only be worth one mark, and sometimes you go, well, that must be the right answer. The people, the horrible people writing exams, they'll put in the correct answer. They'll put something which is the obviously wrong. Error. And then there's the other ones which it could be. So it's not, it's not even a one in four, well, I suppose it is a one in four chance, but they, they can be tricky. And sometimes right. you can get really stuck into it and spend like five minutes trying to get a multiple choice question when you just need to move on. So, um, yeah, th there I'm, are some. I want to do this. this. <laughs> okay, <laughs> if you'll fine. allow me, yeah. I would love to have a quick fire attempt and potentially embarrass my lack of physics knowledge. Okay. As to, uh, yeah, I just think it's. I don't know. I'm, I'm sure the viewers hopefully will agree. I think this would be quite entertaining to see just how bad my physics knowledge maybe, maybe is. But I think they're good because they, they can test a broad range of the whole course, okay. you know, and it's like little questions here and there. Um, All right, then. So, so do we want to do any of them in particular? Or do we just let, I just some? whiz through them. I, I have no idea what they say. So let's, 
Okay, here we go. Let's, let's just do question number one. Uh, an athlete is running at a speed of about five metres per second. Okay, what's, that's a quite fast. what's a reasonable estimate for the kinetic energy of this oh athlete? Um, five metres per second is quite fast. So if I was just very quickly, energy would be a half mv squared. Yeah. So that's then a half times the mass of a human times the velocity, which is going to be 25, mass of a human, let's just call it 100 for easiness of maths. That is a muscly athlete, isn't it? 50. <laughs> It's going to be a sprinter. Yeah, yeah, that's cool. 50 times 25. So that is coming out at like uh, 900 joules. C. Yeah, yeah. So I can see something like that. Like order of a thousand. Is order what of I'm a thousand, thinking. yeah. And this one here, you know, don't it's... even look at the answer because they, they kind of sway you. They kind of pull you one way or the other. Think about, you know, can you relate this to real life? And then. Yeah, it's like if it's eight hundred thousand, that's far too Way high. Too many, and the others are just look... far too small. So yeah, yeah, and I think sometimes people sort of forget the kind of the masses of everyday objects. And but yeah, hundred, you know, it's a bit high, but I'm approaching that. I'm approaching that at the moment, right? Okay, um, right. The next one: which pair of quantities has the same SI base units? Okay, so force is newtons. I would say so. Yeah. Force equals newtons. Strain. You told me what strain was. Strain was dimensionless. That's it, yeah. Strain uh, equals, I'm just going to write zero, but I know what that means. Uh, stress was Pascal's. Okay, that maybe that's a force. Maybe, let's see. Uh, pressure, no, pressure is a stress. Pressure and stress are the same thing. Yeah. So it's C. It's definitely C. That's it, yeah. So they're both yeah. the, the kind of the force over... A unit cross section area, area, unless yeah. they have the same. SA that's unit. why I was when I wrote stress down. I, I knew there was something in my head saying force, and that's why initially I was like, "Oh, maybe they're the same." But no, pressure and stress the same thing. Very nice. Okay, um, we'll do. I guess I think a lot of this sort of comes up again and again. So this is actually similar to one of the other questions. So now we've got a tennis ball is hit with a racket. Yeah. The force applied by the racket is F. The ball has a vertical path through the air. Which statement is correct when the ball is at its maximum height? So this one here is very much, you've got to read the statements, work out what isn't true, but at its maximum height. Force applied by the back of the ball is F, right? So the force acting on the ball is F. The ball experiences its greatest drag at its maximum height. No, that would be when it's going its fastest. So it's definitely not C. At its maximum height, it has to have a downward acceleration, does it? Let me think. Um, it's about to move downwards. So yeah. the only way it can start to move downwards is if it's accelerating downwards. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's got to pass from like, I'm just thinking of it going vertical. It's got to pass from zero velocity to negative. Yeah. So the only way that can change is that's a negative change in velocity, which is a negative acceleration. So I think, I think it's A. Correct, yeah. Woo. So once that racket has hit the ball, there's no more force on the ball from that. And the whole of its journey is it's going up and it's slowing down and then it starts to accelerate down again. The only force acting on it is due to its weight. Yep. And therefore, it's always going to have a downward acceleration. Yep. And there's going to be a point in time, you know, like an infinitesimally small amount of time where it's stationary, but it's still accelerating yes. down, which is yeah, like, yeah, yeah. that doesn't make sense. But at <laughs> some point, it must be. It must be at that point yeah, where yeah, it's yeah. turned You can never get it at that point, but it exists. No, exactly. Yes. Cool. Doing pretty good, actually. You this should be doing level no, physics. Like right, this. okay. Uh, let's do a few more. So number four, uh, this one is about an oscillator, uh, which is forced to oscillate oh, at different frequencies. And here we've got a kind of standard physics graph um, of oh, something. Against frequency. Okay, so as if it's, so it's saying that if you, if you oscillate it at a very low frequency, the amplitude is medium, at a high frequency, the amplitude is small, and it's somewhere in the middle. It has a peak. Yeah, the, this is um, okay. kind of this kind of sweet spot called yep. resonance. Yeah. Oh, okay. Right. Gotcha. And, we, and you might sort of see that. Um, you know, you might have been on a bus maybe when suddenly at maybe a set of traffic lights, the bus starts vibrating, the window starts. Yeah, shaking. yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it's amplifying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but the question is really about if you were to, if the damping on the oscillator is decreased, what would happen to the shape of that graph? The damping on it. So the damping is stopping it from oscillating as much. So the, amp the, the damping is reducing the amplitude. So if you decrease the damping, the amplitude would go up. So which of the following is correct? The amplitude of the oscillation at any frequency decreases. That's false. I think the amplitude would go up if you have a lower damping. It would allow it mm -hmm. to have a bigger movement. The maximum amplitude occurs at a lower frequency. 
Would the damping effect? I think no. The peak on the graph becomes thinner. Okay, so my initial thought is they're all false, but I think maybe <laughs> I'm not realizing there's probably some relationship about damping versus frequency that I may be unsure of. Yeah. Yeah, 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 that's what I'm missing, isn't it? So I know one is false. Mm -hmm. I know one is false, so it can't be A and it can't be D. Okay. Because it says which of them are correct. So I, I am certain that one is false. So now it's 50-50. So now it's 50-50. It? Which one feels, would I expect the peak to become thinner? Or would I expect... Oh, I think two. I think B. Okay. I think B. Feels the most intuitive of the possible whether... Yeah, B feels like it might be true. Cool. Just going to check the answer. <laughs> Are we editing this out of me? Okay, um, no, actually, that, that's not quite correct. You're very close. Definitely, um, the amplitude of the oscillations actually increases. So the yeah, first so one is false. So, yeah, yeah, and actually, okay. sometimes this is a really good approach to take, is that you kind of, if you know it's definitely not one of them, then yeah. you know, you've gone from one in four to one in two, if you were going to guess. Yeah. Um, but actually, uh, the peak on the graph becomes thinner. And so rather than this kind of sort of broader peak... It <sighs> makes sense. At, if you have less damping, it tends to be kind of higher up, kind of so thinner. Very thin. No, it, yeah, that was, I feel like I knew yeah, that. Yeah. I just... <laughs> but but that, that's tricky though. That's, that's uh. a kind of tricky kind of, kind of thing, which is normally taught towards the end of year 13. All right, okay. okay. All right, I feel less bad then. All right. Um, okay, now we've got... I need to redeem myself. Okay, so this one is about the gravitational force between two objects. Now, obviously, Newton, he didn't just do his three laws. He had his law of gravitation as well, which I think is yes, brilliant. Yes, yes. Probably one of my one favorite ones, squared. actually. Yeah, is that what so, it's going to ask me? Please tell me it's that. Uh, so it says the gravitational force between two point masses, x yeah. and y, is F1. Yeah. And I think diagrams are really helpful, aren't they? Cause yeah, oh, God, yeah. Just because I... it's a wordy question, get it in the diagram. It just draw, That picture really illustrates it. Now, the mass of x is increased, and the distance between x and y is halved. Okay, so x mass goes up, distance goes down. Yeah, okay. it's, it's halved yep. as well. That's important, I think. Unhalved, yeah. Um, which statement about the new gravitational force F2 between these two objects is correct? Okay, so the fact that the mass has gone up means there will be an increase. Higher mass means, wait, does it? Yeah, higher mass means bigger gravitational force. Just think about the planets. Like yeah. Gravity on Earth is bigger than the moon. Yeah, so if the mass is going up, however, as the distance goes down, that's also going to increase the gravitational strength because I know that gravity behaves like a one over distance squared law. Yeah. So, so far, so, you're basically saying the new force is bigger than the previous force? Definitely. Good. So and now we've got F2, some options. Right. Yeah. So F2 is definitely bigger than F1. So it's not A, could be B, yep. can't be C, could be D. Okay. So it's B or D. Now it's talking about size, right? Yeah. Because I knew they were going to use the half bit. Mm -hmm. So if the mass didn't change and we moved them um, if they were to go twice as far away, so let's think about, I'm going to think about it in reverse. They're close, we move them two times further away, the gravitational force decreases by a factor of four. So by moving them in half, it's going to increase by four. So F2 is greater than four F1. Yes, I think it's B. Okay. I think it's B because the mass has also gone up, which makes, F, if the mass didn't change, F2 would be equal to 4F1. Correct, yes. But it, the mass has gone up as well, so F2 is a bit bigger. And so it must be yeah, bigger, yeah, and it's yeah. not even bigger than or equal to, because it must always be bigger than that. Yes. So yeah, B is correct. F2 is bigger than 4F1. Very I'm nice. Doing this. Yeah, Could right. do this all day. <laughs> well, how long have we got? Um, that's, that's kind of my job, really, kind of doing stuff like physics all day. Um, right, which one looks does. nice? Which one looks... I'm just seeing how many are there. There are 15 in total, and I've done should five. Should we do a couple more? Let's do a couple. Do you want to pick? Okay, rather than me doing them all, because I okay. can literally sit here and do this all day. Yeah, okay. Do you want to pick one or two ones remaining yeah. that you think? Let's do that with a bit more physics, not just okay. not just mechanics. Okay, okay, cool. We could do thirteen. Okay. Because that's what people really hate it. Okay. Yeah. All right. I will okay. do. I'm going to do the question everyone hates. So we do. Let's let's have a do. I'm happy. Should, to should go we just on. do thirteen at the end and leave it there, or do you want to do? Um, I think I like your idea of ending with two. Okay. Unless you Huxley, I recognise Huxley. All right, we're going to do ten and thirteen. Okay. I've picked one. <laughs> I'm picking my own exam questions. Okay, so. um, right, seeing as I picked it, let's yeah. start with 10 in Huxlaw. <laughs> yeah, so number 10, uh, this is where we have a spring <laughs> being stretched by a mass hanging on it. This is kind of like your standard 
physics practical. Um, super That's why easy. I was drawn to it, yeah. Super easy to set up if you're a teacher. Um, and basically it says the mass is always at rest and the spring obeys Hooke's law. So I know Hooke's law, I do remember this, that's telling me that the, the, the force, the force pulling it back up. Yeah. Is, so I don't know if I need to label these differently, but let's, let's just, I'm going to call this FH because to remind me it's Hooke's, okay. is equal to uh, some constant times the extension, extension. Yeah. Right, where X is extension beyond its normal kind of length. Yeah, so the extension is going to be proportional to the force applied. Effectively, you double yeah. the force, you double the extension. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. in a relationship. Yeah. Um, but the question is, what's the relationship between the elastic potential energy, E, in the spring, and the mass, M? So, obviously, I guess you, you, you pull a spring. <sighs> I have no idea. Okay, right. <laughs> um, is there a formula for elastic potential energy? There is, yeah. I, as a physics student, I might know. You, you probably, you should remember it if you're a physics student. Yeah. Or you can, might be able to look it up in, like, the, the data book. Uh, See, so the energy, E, is going to yeah. be equal to a half Fx. The energy is a half. And what is f of x? So is f, it f is, times sorry, x? F, f times x. Oh, f times yeah, x. Yeah, so the force multiplied by the extension, half of that would be equal to the energy stored in that spring. Okay. So am I then... Okay. So the force here... Ooh, what am I asked the relationship between... The elastic potential energy E and the mass M. So how do I bring mass into this? So it tells me that the mass is always at rest. Yeah. So the force is acting against gravity. Hooke's law is acting against gravity. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I, I guess this is where. So this is. So like if it's a, not moving, then is it saying that that's mg? Yeah. So the force downwards. Is mg, MG yeah, yeah, is providing the force that's causing it to extend. And that has to be the same as Hooke's law because it's not moving. Yeah. Told it's yeah, so it's an equilibrium, you know, the, the forces so are balanced. KX. Okay, where well, X is the extension. Is, there, mm. is this also the same extension here? Yes. Okay, good. I think I might have this then. Because that's now telling me, then, he says this. So that tells me that E is equal to a half times F, but F is MG, times X. But... I don't know the extension, but I also do know that from here, yep. the x is mg over k. That's it. So I think I can sub that in, right? A half mg times mg over k. And it asks me, so I'm thinking there's an m squared. So I'm thinking it's d. Yeah, that's right. And g is going to be constant, k is constant. So the extension. Of course, but there's a g squared in there, interesting. Okay. Yeah, yeah, mm. but that's just a constant. So yeah. no, the energy stored is going yep. to be proportional to the mass squared. Um, awesome. Right. Okay, one more question. Yes, last one. Okay, so so this is something that, if you're a physics student watching this, you'll be groaning and going, oh, it's percentage uncertainties. Because in physics, we tend to look at real, real bits of data. We measure yeah. things using meter rulers and so on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you can't always get the measurements perfect. But there's going to be some error in whatever you've recorded. Mm -hmm. So this one, actually, this is the equation that it's kind of kind of similar to maybe what we've done already. So the young modulus of a metal can be determined using the expression E is equal to 4F. E is 4F over, over epsilon pi, A pi D squared. D squared. OK, great. So that pi D squared over 4 is coming in with the area. Yeah, yeah, that, my yeah. favourite equation. I remember. It's in there. It's in there. Um, yeah, so there's loads of information there. And we want to look at the percentage uncertainty in the calculated value of E. So somebody's set up an experiment, they want to work out the young modulus or something. And in the table, it's given us the percentage uncertainties in the force yep. applied, the, the strain, which is epsilon, and also the diameter of that wire. So what I know is, I like this question already, I think. Oh, you <laughs> might like matzy. it, or you might I be like, like it less okay. than a minute. Right, cool. It feels matzy, because <clears throat> what I kind of want to, Okay, so I have some value for f, but the point is that value could be anywhere between um, the true value of f, which I'm going to write as 1, but it could be plus or minus um, 0 0.053 for f. Okay. It's potentially what I want to say. I don't know if this is how a physics student would do it, but this is how I'm going to think about it. Epsilon 
is similar. So for epsilon, it's actually, I'm assuming the percentage of certainty is going to go both ways, right? Mm -hmm. So 0 0.012, would that be right? Yeah, that would be right, um, times epsilon. And then 1 plus or minus 0 0.01. Yeah, that would be 1% of D. So, plugging that into E, what is the percentage uncertainty? So I'm guessing we want the maximum possible uncertainty that could sort of yeah. be, be encapsulated in the formula. So what that means then is I want to maximize. So if I take them all as, ooh. Okay, so I think I want to maximize E. I want to find its max value. So I want the biggest value on top. So I'm going to say E is 4. So I want the 0 0. 0 0.053. So 1, okay, let me write this properly. I think on the top I want 1.053 of F. So that's the biggest possible error in F. Mm -hmm. And then I want the biggest possible error in E. But we're dividing by E. So the biggest possible, the largest value you could get for capital E, because I'm dividing by epsilon, sorry, yeah. is when that's going to be small. So I think I want the, the small one. So I want, so I think I want 0. Point, oh God, this is where I really do need a calculator. 0. 0.9, <laughs> 0. 0.988 E. And then I think I want the same for D. I want the small value. So, but it's going to be D squared. So I still want 0. 0.99 squared of d squared and then there's still a pi as well so i think that is the maximum possible value that e could have okay so i think this is e max and i think if i worked that out now obviously i've got the same formula so i think i'm sort of saying the biggest thing it could have would be 1.053 divided by 0.988 times 0.99 squared i think if i plug that in i'm going to get a number I need a calculator, don't I? You do. And is it going to be A, B, C, or D? Oh, God. I think it's one of the bigger ones, for sure. But maybe I can actually... Do we have a calculator I can use? We do, yeah. <laughs> can... I'll be back in a minute. <laughs> I actually need one now. I can't, I can't answer this without a calculator. I'm, I'm gonna, I'm, I want to end with the correct answer, so I'm going to finally cave in. Okay, so thank you, Lewis. Just a, <laughs> Great little pink one. I just love a, it. a standard, you know, like the kind of really cheap scientific calculator. That's all you need for A level physics, really. So I think it's 1.053 divided by bracket 0.988, um, close bracket. Um, let's just do that one first. And then that answer is then divided by 0.99 squared. But if I just do divide by 0.99 and then divide by it again, yeah. just to be simple. It gives me 1.087. So I think it's D then. I'm not getting an exact answer, but I think it's D. My guess is going to be D. I think okay. it is the maximum possible. So you got it right using a completely different method to how <laughs> I would do it, or how we do it in physics. That's now, what I love. Yes. Um, so, so this kind of question here, this is just a way of kind of guessing, really, like yeah, the yeah, total yeah. uncertainty in a reading. When we're looking at uncertainties in experimental methods, it's because you can't get everything perfect. You've got to yeah. use physical things to maybe, you know, look at the size of the force. And this is just a way to kind of, I guess, guesstimate the, the approximate uncertainty yep. in that final answer. And for this one, all we need to do is add up these terms every time we see them in the equation. So... We've so, got, yeah, so... I have overcomplicated this yeah. so, so much. <laughs> so to work out or calculate the Young modulus, uh, 4 and pi, they're just constants, so there's no yeah. uncertainty there. But we've got the fourth term comes up once, so we're going to yeah. add 5.3 to the strain, which is 1.2, yeah. that's what, 6.5. But we've got d squared, so any error in d is going to be magnified. So what we do then is we just add the error in d twice. Yeah. So we're going to go from 6.5 to 7.5 to 8.5. So that's why my sort of overcomplicated exact way of doing it yeah. didn't give 8.5. It gave about 8.7 because this is obviously an approximation, like you say. This Absolutely. is just estimate, get a good idea of the error. Because yeah. I've tried to get like the exact. <laughs> it is. And of course, you could take this, error, you could analyze it more. But yeah. really what it's trying to say is that in this experiment, the main source of error came from looking at the force. So yeah. if you had a better method, maybe 
you got it down to 0 0.54, 0 0.53, that would make your final answer, you'd be much more certain about it. Yeah. And it's really trying to identify where the biggest errors are coming from. So for this one, we just add them all up. Yeah. And uh, it's, it's it just works. like a, an A-level physics thing. People might do it differently at university. Yes. Um, but, but it's a good approximation and it's yeah, fairly yeah. quick and simple. But overall, I thought you did amazingly well. I mean, for somebody who's not done A-level maths, you've... A-level physics. A, oh, sorry, you did A-level <laughs> maths. definitely done A-level yeah. maths. For somebody having not done A-level physics, you've come in and had a, a really good approach to, to all the questions that you've done. So, yeah, um, I, I think it also shows really that if you can do A-level maths, then you're more than capable of doing A-level physics with a bit of yeah. time put into it. I, I, as the person who has done this experiment, I, I agree with you, Lewis. Yeah, that felt like a lot of the skills I, I have picked up as a mathematician mm. yeah. were basically were really, really helpful in understanding those problems. Um, and that was really fun. Genuinely, yeah, that's like, cool. really, that's, that's really fun. Lovely to hear. I mean, I love physics. I mean, I'm, I'm biased. I'm sure we yeah, both yeah, are. Yeah. But yeah, I, I think when you get when you get the answer correct, that's when it's fun, yeah, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, 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 no, yeah absolutely. Yeah, no, no, I, I, the whole process, it was, was great. So thank you so much for, for challenging me in the first place. No problem and at all. For, and for sharing um, these questions with me and picking them and, and obviously coming to Oxford. Um, it's much appreciated. Um, for those of you watching, if you haven't seen what Lewis does, do check out his channel, Physics Online. It's it's written on the T-shirt. Yeah, I got the brand. Here, so. <laughs> <laughs> um, and we are gonna um, we're gonna do a follow up, aren't we? We will. Yeah. Um, so I Lewis has sent me physics questions, so it kind of feels only fair that I should be doing some A level. That he maths. should be doing some math. So when you're checking out. Lewis's channel, do make sure to watch the follow-up video in this series where Lewis will be doing some maths questions. And I am gonna, I think I'll be nice. I feel like you were Hopefully. nice to me, yeah, so we'll I'll, I'll we'll probably see. be nice. Um, thank you as always for watching. Um, and of course, please do also subscribe to my channel. It's really helpful uh, if you have enjoyed this. And uh, I'll see you all very soon with some more maths fun. Take care.